main oh. impulse in this process is what flowed into earthly evolution. <laughs> okay. Welcome. And here we are. I'm John Barnwell in Detroit, the Straits, Detroit. Here with the Reverend David William Perry in the city of London and merry old England. Not as merry as it could possibly be, but that's an individual thing, I guess. And I, I've racked my brain to try and resolve some questions that are flying at me. And, and there's so many directions that things are flying at me that honestly, I'm nonplussed, but not intimidated. <laughs> the issue that, that, that keeps coming to the surface is the relationship of the individual to the group. And, and what is the mission of Earth evolution? What are, we, what are we doing here? What is the point of all of this? And uh, people that come here frequently know that I have a tendency to almost always contextualize within the context of spiritual science of the work of Dr. Rudolf Steiner, anthroposophy, as it was labeled. And in light of that, uh, that's a difficult premise because I consider it to be the most difficult subject that one can study because there are no definitions. Everything is approached from different perspectives that are related to the time in which they're referring to, the time in which they're given, the place in which they're given, and the time to which the events are referring to uh, during the whole course of Earth evolution and before and after. And so when you start taking all those viewpoints into consideration, it starts to, to complicate things to the point to where people that tend to want to simplify uh, and get to uh, a fundamental, you know, the universal truth. What is the universal truth? And being as our show is called, What is Truth? And that my personal and Reverend David's, I can confidently add, draw our principal source of inspiration from our Lord Jesus Christ. If someone has a problem with that, good. There's plenty of other things you could be doing, watching football or what have you. And that's okay. I don't mind. My feelings are not hurt. But in taking this and trying to, to go a bit further, I think that uh, there are simple concepts that one can work with that, that could be very helpful. For example, uh, Rudolf Steiner makes the point that uh, before the mystery of Golgotha, which is the incarnation of Christ, and the crucifixion and that whole mystery, before that time, he says that people had kind of an instinctive wisdom regarding the things in life because they were at a point of, of equilibrium between uh, the supersensible and the sensible. And that the, the challenge is that one can get too caught up in the life of the senses and especially with abstract thinking. So when I'm doing a critique of abstract thinking, I'm referring to abstract thinking that is basically sense-bound, okay? And, and because abstract thinking can be utilized in a spiritualized form, even if you're not uh, inclined to uh, spiritual subjects because merely by studying mathematics, for example, one can find a, a universal uh, application that, that works out, that there's a certain comfort a mathematician uh, feels when he works on a formula and 
he he can come up with the same answer every time. That makes him feel good. It gives him a sense of security. But if you apply that sense of security, coming from that realm <clears throat> directly into the life of the senses, it's going to lead you into conflict because, of course, there are other forces at play that, that aren't within your formula. And so that, that's what uh, uh, your, your contour, uh, the mathematician, called an open set. And that the, that the things that you're, are in your purview, that are in your consideration, that's not the total picture. And so you get into uh, approaching it. And, and on the other side, there's this kind of uh, ennui or, or weary of the world vantage point uh, to dismiss that which is worldly. Like, like Soma is kind of tendency towards the East. This tendency is, is more the Eastern school and the Western school is much more caught up in the life of the senses. And so Rita Steiner says that to, to, to find one's way within this, it behooves one to come to a point of equilibrium between those two perspectives. And that that's what can give you the presence of mind if you have it imbued with the life of feeling. And see, that's the thing that people uh, miss so much because they're not accustomed to being told, okay, well, yeah, you could think about this particular thought, but it's only going to have the, its depth of meaning if you imbue it in the realm of feeling. And I mean, you tell that to a mathematician that he's got to take his formulas and, and imbue them with a life of feeling, even though he does it unconsciously because he gets that satisfaction from, from uh, doing a formula and having it actually work out the same every time. So you see, we're in a bit of a quandary here because there's people that are disinclined to bring the life of feeling into their, their uh, realm of thoughts and specifically the realm of speech and the way in which we talk to other people. I mean, there's all manner of violence that's done to the world when, like uh, Rebbe alone, he, when he says, you know, that you mustn't think that, that the, the law that you shouldn't, shouldn't kill, that you shouldn't murder, is merely limited to just killing someone. You can kill somebody with your words. And so there's this, this violence that's, that happens within the realm of speech that's very, very unwholesome. And especially when it starts getting into this contest about, well, you're in this group and you don't like what this other group over here said. I'm not even going to get into naming any names because it's there's no point because the context is clear. Is that as long as you're caught up in that, you're not current, see? And, and based on the principles of spiritual science, since 1879, when Archangel Michael defeated the legion of forces of mammon in the astral world, what occurred is that there unfolded a challenge for mankind to take up the task of defeating mammon in our realm defeating mammon in our own being. And so that's that's a hefty challenge. So when you consider that mammon isn't just love of money and all of that, there is that, and, and that's an important uh, sidebar because so much of what's wrong with the world today is that people are bought off. You got your politicians, your people that are supposed to be taking care of your health while well, they're bought up to you. Uh, the people that are teaching your children while well, they're bought up to. So there's always people that are on the dole in order to go along with some kind of program or another, some kind of belief system or another. And all these, all this structuralist uh, formulaic political thinking that, that is the source of so many problems in the world today. And so in getting deeper into that, 
and and what is the under underpinning of this and it really if you want to go back to the source waters you have to go back before atlantis all the way back to lemuria and you go back to the story of adam and eve and there you have the archetypal challenge that the 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 Cain and Abel story and even the the concept that Adam didn't have a mother I mean if you're paying attention in the Old Testament there's no mother he didn't have a mother okay and so what does that mean and then when you see Saint Paul referring to to Jesus Christ as the second Adam well what does that mean because with Christ, it, the, with the whole concept of the virgin birth brings in the idea that he didn't have a father. It's, it's like the widow's son, the, the son of the widow. And actually in, in the story according to Passed Down is that Joseph uh, passed, you know, and, and uh, the mother of Jesus, right? Uh, Mary Sophia went with John to, to Patmos, and and while at Patmos, John wrote the Apocalypse, and and he lived longer than all the other disciples. So you can get in. There's so many levels of narrative that that hinge on these fundamental concepts that they're they're useful to work with. But again, we're talking about uh, serving the riddle, and 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 so we're we're here to pursue what is truth, but we're doing it by improving our questions. We're not doing it by telling you what we think the answer is. I just want to make that perfectly clear. You know, because when somebody says to you, uh, this sentence is false, if you think about it, well, if that sentence is false, then what you just said isn't true. And so if it isn't true, that means this sentence is, is this true or is it false? <laughs> See, so there's, there's a way in which uh, certain constructuralist approaches, they're ineffectual. And so if you take the mathematical thinking that's utilized by physicists and you try to apply it in the realm of plants, forget about it. You're not gonna be able to, to, to really figure it out, uh, let alone uh, the life of an animal or the, the function of the human body. And so we're getting into a lot of levels of, of complexity. And I, and I, you know, when I do my, my uh, work as I approach these talks, you know, I, I realize that I have to tone it down a bit because I tend to follow my own uh, quest here. And I realize that not everybody out there is going to be able to follow certain things if I approach them too hastily. And so without approaching too hastily, Reverend David, how are you there, friend? What an amazing link. What an amazing link. Um, good afternoon, John. Um, I've just come hot foot um, from giving a sermon. It was more like a meditation to the online uh, Persian Christian, online Persian Christian fellowship so I'm, I'm still half in preacher mode at the minute um of course it's remembrance sunday here i was shifting notes in front of me what i was using for the the fellowship so i'm, I'm feeling in a very meditative mood i mean um th there's a time for shooting facts and names and figures at people and then there's a time for reflection um so i suppose i'm feeling that today you know and all those deaths, all those deaths in World War One and World War Two. I mean, there are death days, of course, in every culture. Um, and All Souls, which is, you know, there was always an ambiguity in Britain between Halloween, the pagany bit, and All Souls, the Christian bit. There was always a sort of weird continuity between that anyway. Um, and All Souls somehow, because of the, her the horror of two world wars, somehow got conflated into a period which finishes today with Remembrance Sunday where Her Majesty the Queen um, goes and remembers those who, who, who passed over. Although I, I, I heard somewhere on the grapevine she was ill today so she couldn't go. Um, and of course there are, there are celebrations, if that's the right word, remembrances across the country about those 
endlessly lost lives. I mean, uh, I'm using poetry, but it's not. It's not. I mean, that's how it felt to everybody concerned. Um, so I'm feeling, I don't know, a bit, a bit down and a bit thoughtful about that sort of stuff. So we went through one of the meditations on the end time, the prophecies of the end time. And I think they got some benefit out of it. I know I did. I know I did. Um, how am I feeling apart from that? Um, Boris Johnson, why don't you just resign and get on with it? Right, that got out. That got that out of the way. Um, I'm. He's not got long. He's not got long. He suddenly realised that to ask people for inordinate taxes um, is not necessarily the best thing to do if you're a Tory. You can probably get away with it if you're a Labour guy, but you probably can't get away with it if you're a Tory. So ructions are on the way before Crimbo, uh, a fine and familiar way of saying Christmas. Uh, merry Old England isn't particularly merry at the minute, which I'm very sorry to report to everybody because it should be. The land of Shakespeare should be. Yes, I'm a self-confessed cantor boy. Um, I suspect that transfinite mathematics is at the very early stages of its development. Personally, I, when, I, when I read what cantor is trying to do, um, I can't help sensing, I can't help intuiting a sense of ecstasy in what he's doing. So I'm not sure as tedious mathematicians go, that's what we're looking at in his case, which is possibly why I like him as opposed to all the others. Um, although I like um, I like Isaac Newton, but of course, you know, even his endless war with Leibniz, oh, gentlemen, please, you know, it, it doesn't become a man of a particular level of stature to just be rude and nasty. Uh, and of course, I suppose Leibniz got the, the end of, you know, he won. I mean, look at the incredible length of that powdered wig. I mean, you, you win, you win. Um, but, you know, I like... I like uh, Isaac Newton because, of course, you're looking at Britain's last alchemist as opposed to just a mathematician. Uh, so I like all that sort of stuff. And they were very clearly drawing uh, emotions into it. I don't know. I want us to be more emotional. I want us to be more emotional. Um, uh, my partner and I were watching. Have you heard of this awful phenomenon called TikTok? Uh, some sort of Chinese invention, I hear. Um, I do amazing dances on TikTok, by the way, if anybody wants to check that out. But, I mean, that's apart from the self-plug. We saw some incredibly depressing footage. It's a new game in London where in broad daylight, uh, young men, healthy-looking young men in motorcycle helmets walk up to the front of somebody's house with a type of drill and try and steal either their car or, or their, their bikes, or their, their motorbikes or push bikes in front of everybody. That's the new game that's happening in merry old Britain, merry old England. Um, shameless, thoughtless, arrogant, nasty, and the real level of law and order in Boris's halcyon UK. Um, can we all go back to being Europeans now, please? Um, that should get that should get a, a reaction. Um, although, were we always? Were we always? You know, no, so no, I'm feeling quite, quite down about ministry across the board. So why is the church so powerless? Why isn't it reaching the young? Why are the young so estranged? I mean, you use that wonderful French word on. Why is that, to my mind, the prevalent feeling amongst the so-called lower orders in Britain? Uh, I mean, you, you Yankee boys, you have everything easy. A classless society. And the chance to become president, what's wrong with you all? My God, there's nothing like that over here. You know, you'll, you'll never be king, you'll never be queen, forget it. Um, so the, if we're speaking about ennui. I imagine that sinks into the system a great deal. No, but one of us got to be prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> but prime minister, prime minister, Boris was born in New York. So <laughs> <laughs> tell me what that means. Yeah, I don't. I know. I mean, I no. I think it's nearly a false position in some ways. Seeing that you've got lots of executive power, but you don't have the veto. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, those those little hands in those little gloves have absolutely immense money and power at her disposal. So you're not going to win. Um, you know. So no, I, I, 
I, I think, you know, even on The Simpsons, I love The Simpsons. You know, I noticed they had Tony Blair on one of the episodes and they're portraying him. They portrayed him basically as the British president, but you, just using the phrase prime minister instead. No, he's not. The prime minister is not a president. The head of state is the sovereign. The end. There's no discussion. Uh, will Charles have to be the next king? Yes, the end, or it's called abdication. It's not his choice. It's not our choice. It's nobody's choice. He must do it. Or perhaps we get the Holy Grail and he doesn't want to do it and he abdicates. Then evil bastards like me can say, why do we need a, a monarchy in the 21st century? Looking forward to that, if possible. <laughs> but I doubt if that will arise. So, you know, why aren't we reaching what has happened in the great staff of life, which isn't only physical bread, but metaphysical bread passed from one generation to the other. Um, it, there's no communication at the minute with an ever increasing underclass. I don't like class terms and analyses of that type anyway. Normally I, I tend to reject, forgive me for speaking completely personally at the minute, that type of social sciences easy designations. I, I find that it's all arrived at too quickly. Um, but there is a clear subsection of a noble working class, which now seems to have allegiances to nobody, including each other. Um, no sense of loyalty, no sense of honor, no sense of nation, no sense of state. In fact, no sense of history or anything. Um, which was exemplified in the footage we saw yesterday. Nobody wants to talk about it. Boris pretends that yeah, that didn't exist in the 1940s and 50s, so it won't because he's prime minister. No. Um, I wish we could find as churches, as universities, as intellectuals, as anthroposophists, ways of talking with the young about things that are still important to anyone who's human um so that's how i'm feeling today john i'm feeling very very rankled and wondering what to do i'll give you a secret of something that did happen that might be a clue um years back a friend gave me um a mjornir a, a wonderful little chain with thor's hammer about that size uh to wear around my neck um, I did wear it for a while because it was a gift and it was actually quite an attractive little gift. Um, I noticed one of the young men in the local vicinity of when I lived in those days recognizing it and a sense of near tribal identity, not from my part, uh, kicking into place. But is that the only way we're going to reach people now? Ever greater restrictions and ever greater concerns as we move into a new jungle, um, have all the thoughts and the struggles of the libertarians and liberals of the last 200 years come to nothing? Sadly, it looks like the answer is yes. Handing back to you. Yeah, you, you'd think, gee, I thought that we, we crossed the Rubicon long ago, and, and yet, no, we're not there yet. Uh, there's been an advance guard that went across, but it seems as though there's a, a large segment that has lagged behind in in their unknowingness, shall we say. It's as if they, they don't know any better, and, and they, it appears they don't want to know any better, that they're looking for creature comfort more than equity. And so uh, that's a challenge. But I'm reminded of uh, an email that I got this morning from Roseanne Barr, dear Roseanne. She's, she's such a sweetheart, full of vim and vigor and a real firebrand to boot, who is, by the way, uh, a, a red-pilled liberal, just, just so everybody knows where she stands that she was uh, very much a, a, an activist, liberal activist, until she realized that the liberals are no, are no longer liberal. And so that's just a costume that they wear. And, but she had a very insightful remark that, that is one that can be used on, on most occasions as long as you contextualize it properly. But she says uh, it's really time to take the next step 
which everyone fears so very much. But it's not scary at all. It is a step out of separatism, away from the devil, tricking us into thinking we are not a part of the whole. And I like that. So Roseanne, uh, if you're out there at some point down the road, hey there, kid. And and so yes, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. As you know, I, I aspire to be a hipsisterian, along with Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And the hipsisterian was a group that that Goethe found out about that celebrated uh, excellence uh, f- for people, whether they were Christian, pagan, Jewish, Muslim, whatever. If it was excellence. It, it deserved to be acknowledged. And so that's kind of where I like to, to uh, hang up my hat is, is my aspiration to be a hipsisterian and not get caught up into thinking that there's something superior about me because I belong to a particular club or some group or my ancestral lineage or whatever that kind of stuff is that was very relevant not too long ago, and, and the way that fits into spiritual science, you'd say that during the age of Gabriel, which has to do with the mysteries of birth, the mysteries of secret associations, the mystery of formulating a new uh, configuration within humanity, and in preparation, because the Gabriel is the archangel of the moon, and and the moon has to do with consolidation, crystallization, and forming. I'm reminded of uh, Fab Dovet's translation of the first verses of Genesis that became so popular uh, back in the early days of Freemasonry. He said, you know, where, you know, where, where it says, and, and, and the darkness moved across the face of the waters. It's where it's, it's frequently translated. And he said, the hard making power moved across the contingent potentiality of being. And that's like, yeah, I get that. Because you're talking about the activity the spirits have formed. And they're, they're the beings that are, if the four stage up from us beings that consolidate the world of form. And so if you get into the secret doctrine and Blavatsky introduces the idea of the outbreathing and inbreathing that is the process of coming out of pralaya or rest and that the, the, the chain of worlds of which the earth is the fourth world, that there was this, a sequence of, of, of worlds that are essentially, as Rudolf Steiner says, should be looked upon as states of consciousness. And so we have the proto-physical realm of old Saturn, and then it goes into Pralaya, period of rest for beings below a certain level, and then arises again in the old sun evolution and reduction of light into that primordial physical warmth from old Saturn. And then it goes into Pralaya again. And then you have old moon and you have coming into that, the whole uh, idea of the astral. And then that goes into a period of rest. It's in breathe again. And then it comes with the out breathing again and it recapitulates all those stages. And it gets us to the point to where eventually uh, we have Earth evolution coming into being the, as the fourth world, as my friend, the spokesman for the Hopi elders, Thomas Bunyaki, like to say, yeah, this is the fourth world. And so we're, we're living in this fourth world. We're at our human stage. This is the first, the fourth mystery of, of birth and death. And so in coming into that challenge, that riddle of what is birth and what is death, you have to see that that that's something that, that can give us freedom, that there's a gift associated with that whole idea and the whole drama that's enacted in 
genesis in the hard making power moving across the contingent potentiality of being is about the consolidation of the physical realm and at some point i don't know that i'll get here today but i, I want to be able to show the difference between uh, the principal work of Madame Helena Blavatsky, The Secret Doctrine, and the way she describes that sequence, and Rudolf Steiner's version of it, that the principal source is what was originally published as an occult science and outline, or now is published as an outline of esoteric science. And and, and in there, he, he gives that whole symphony of of the creative impulses from the spiritual world and how things come into being and pass out of being. And to be perfectly honest, people that, that watch this show, if you haven't read that book, if you haven't read uh, his book, Theosophy, or if you haven't read his book, Knowledge of Higher Worlds, or at least The Philosophy of Freedom, you probably won't have the context to understand a lot of the conversations that we have here. It's not no hard feelings. It's just like you can't, discuss calculus with a four-year-old, you know, unless it's an exceptionally gifted four-year-old. That was something Chuck Missler, the evangelical preacher, I admire him no end, I'm sure he's with the angels now, used to say. There were, only, there were certain things in mathematics that you could only tell advanced mathematicians or young children. And I actually think he... He hit, that's a bullseye, that's a bullseye. Um, yeah, I mean, esoteric languages are very important and therefore the development and evolution of the sophisticated and we need more people willing to take that yoke and that burden upon themselves nowadays. Uh, most Christians, forgive me for broad brush strokes, fellow Christians, uh, my dear John, forgive me, are unwilling at the moment to grapple with mystery, which is not doing us any good at all. It's really not doing us any good at all. I mean, right, going back to a minute to the, at the British season of the dead, which, as I say, begins in uh, Pagany Halloween, uh, All Souls, and then sort of ends today. Um, no one really, apart from in their little Christian bubble, of happy, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy land wants to really grapple with the fact there was something called a crucifixion. Um, you know, and that can't really be brushed away. You know, things can go wrong, and there's a purpose to that, there's a meaning to that, which we will never really understand unless we're aware of that. You know, God allows certain things to occur. Um Therefore, I don't know, I'm, I'm torn today between wanting to stand firmly behind those of an esoteric mind, particularly those of a Christian esoteric mind who want to elaborate the mysteries and express them further. And in my fantasy life, I have this dream of reading circles, rather like the great um, Kazakh poet genius Arbai. You know, he started reading circles for the warriors of the steppes and got them all reading, Goethe. I mean, that must have been a sight and a half. You know, these tough warriors in, in their, their battle costumes all sat around reading Goethe. I personally would have loved to have seen that. Um, and it proved our boy's genius. What he wanted to do was say, this is your birthright as human beings as well. Don't be put off by the Russians. Forgive me, Russians. Don't be put off by a, a Kazakh feudal elite, a warrior caste. Don't be put off by anything. It's your birthright as a human being to think, to explore, to expand. That's your birthright. So part of me today really wants to defend the whole esoteric and maybe specifically the anthroposophical uh, uh, enterprise because there's something of immense value in all of that. But it's also balanced against the fact, how on earth are we going to reach the young boys in their bicycle helmets that are ready to commit actually very serious acts of violence to defend and succeed in broad daylight robberies? Um, I think we've got to somehow personally 
and I've always had this this attitude that, that Christians of all people mustn't look away from the darkness because we're saved and protected by the light. We mustn't look away from what's surrounding us. That's that's the work of our enemy uh, to look away and somehow turn Christianity into sugar and spice and all things nice, as opposed to a crucifixion and resurrection. Um, and without the crucifixion and the resurrection, you don't really get the full scale and miracle of redemption. Um, without the pain and without the sin, whatever those things mean, you don't get the relief of paradise regained. Um, so I suppose, yeah, I'm... <sighs> I don't know what I think about tribes and tribal histories and factions. I suspect their importance hasn't really gone yet. And if anything, in Britain, it tends to be those things are resurging, but they're resurging in a negative umbra. They're, they're resurging in a negative form. I don't think that's healthy. And it's really not the – no, I'm not trying to pretend the British are angels by no stretch of the imagination. But it's not healthy. It can be even more unhealthy. Than the East India Company, that was unhealthy. It can be even more unhealthy than that if jingoism and the plain lack of empathy aren't remember, you know, aren't seen for what they are. Remember, I'm talking about the British context, nowhere and nothing else. And we need to think of plans. I mean, I've nearly given up. I mean, curiously, when I had a congregationalist. The bottom line for me is always congregationalism. When a congregationalist church in Shadwell in East London uh, many years ago, I think I've mentioned this before, we used to have armies of football thugs turning up and singing Christmas carols with us. And that was great. It was great. Now, I didn't think that would happen. Now it would be, what are you wasting your time doing that for? You know, pull up another pipe of crack and sit you down. Um, the, the disintegration around us, the social and cultural atomization, have are really going at such a pace that we can't afford to take our eyes off that particular ball. And every possible panacea we can think of to remind each one of us of our own humanity, let alone other people. Um, it's hard to know how enterprises, how projects, how philosophies like anthroposophy can be undervalued at a time like this. Um, I'm hoping to put on a number of things at Rudolf Steiner House in London next year, because not only do they cut you a good deal, it's a wonderful building, uh, but also because we need to promote lifelines. Uh, and that, for me, is a clear lifeline. What This show is a clear lifeline. And I don't want them turning off and running away. I know you're, you're mo in your bohemian moments, my dear friend, you don't care. Um, and although that might not be entirely honest, that's a broadcasting trick if ever I heard one. But you know, I, 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 I want them listening. I want them. I want them guffawing. I want them throwing things at the, the computer screen. I want oh, who are those two old goats and what are they talking about? I want all of it because I, we've got to find ways to re-engage with what it means to be human because to my mind we will never ever ever get to christianity until we've learned out what until we've learned what being human might actually mean my trouble with ai apart from the fact it's a well-funded fantasy um if i was looking for academic funding i'd be lying through my teeth as well that's that's the only way they get it uh, yes prime minister we'll have robots goose stepping up pell mell oh really so no it um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't believe half of it. All I hear at the moment is science fiction, and I see a light show happening every now and again, normally in terms of academic funding. So great, good on you. But it doesn't mean we have to believe it all. Personally, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, all the medical applications we could find. I know people that have lost their use of their spine, the use of their legs. My God, the miracles, the human miracles that could be performed if that got off the ground, um, I'm not necessarily against transhumanism as a as a as a stirring ideal. I mean, what is that in practice? Can't we do better than this? That is really an existential call into the cold winter nights. Can't we do better than this as human beings? Is this all we are? Is is this all we'll amount to? 
when it wants to replace humanity, as Elon Musk appears to do, um, then I don't know what they're talking about. For me, I don't find it scary. I just don't know what you're talking about. How can a man of your money and intelligence talk such rot? I'm sorry. Uh, go and live on Mars. Go and live on Mars. You know, who cares? You know, have a, have a great time. Jeff Bezos, yes, just float off once and for all. Goodbye. You know. um, it's when... <sighs> It's when Christians aren't listening, may, might I even say anthroposophists aren't listening, to the calls of desperation coming from the human soul framed in modern language. I mean, what you're managing to do this evening is bring out the Wittgenstein in me because I'm hearing different vocabularies for the same thing. So in artificial intelligence, I hear... I hear maybe remedial words uh, when it's being sensible. A lot of the time it's not. Um, and what do I hear in AI? The desperate cry for a better world. And my heavens, we need a better world. But it won't be found through abandoning our humanity. It will only be found, to my mind, by doing the one thing we've never been able to do, embracing our humanity. And for me, that is where anthroposophy starts leading to Christianity, and who knows, a personal encounter with the saviour himself. Old old dinosaurs like me find that very exciting. Handing back to you, John. Well, of course, there are no easy answers. Yeah, I like what Oswald said on the sidebar here. He said, Elon Musk is just a typical South African con man grifter. <laughs> Of course, he's still smart, <laughs> is what he says. That's funny. That's hilarious, actually. Yeah, you know. So it's when you get into to looking at at what it is and what they're describing as uh, AI, artificial intelligence, is a stacking of subroutines. Okay, that's essentially what we're looking at. Now, mind you, uh, the level at which that takes place when you start talking in terms of a supercomputer is completely impressive. There's no question about that. But all it is in the final analysis is layers of subroutines. You know, and so if you don't say the keyword that subroutine is looking for, say the word, then it won't pick it up. Okay, and that's like you're you're in a you're at a party and there's you're talking to the guy next to you, and and every fifth word it's vacant. There's nothing there. It's just empty. And that's a subroutine, listening to a conversation. This They, they can't hear uh, things that aren't written into their subroutine, period. And that doesn't smack to me of the, the epitome of compassion. <laughs> and so why am I laughing when it's not funny? Well, maybe it's a, 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 a reflex. Because at this point, uh, the world has become so increasingly stupid at this point that about all one can do is laugh. And that, as I was telling a friend the other day, I think I'm going back to my old job as a rodeo clown because it's a lot easier. And uh, I'd rather be chased around in the rodeo by a bunch of enraged bulls than deal with the, the kind of uh, uh, grappling that we're seeing today and the painful dishonesty that's there f at cross purposes coming from so many different agendas, whether whether they're blackmailed or they're bought off or what have you. All the all the ruses of mammon are in the mix. And so, but like David said, live it. This is what you're here for. You know, the, you know, like uh, Christianity is not like all kumbaya, you know, it's not all like you're going to all hold hands in a circle and sing. There is that. And that's an important thing. But yeah, it's, it's the, the passion and the crucifixion 
that which leads to the resurrection. That's the turning point of time. And so getting into that riddle and trying to figure out, you know, like, uh, mind you, uh, a lot of the, the indigenous peoples, when they were confronted by missionaries and the missionaries trying to explain to them about the basis of their religion and they're not particularly conversant in the language and he keeps pointing at this person hanging on a cross and they thought if you don't go along with what i'm telling you this is what's going to happen to you that's what they thought okay so just so you know that's as a, a power of conversion that wasn't intended but they they were quite surprised by the results they got and there's very few of the missionaries that will cop to what i just said that that's what the natives were thinking oh god if i don't go along with this guy with this stuff i don't understand uh maybe i'll just say okay and then you know he won't stick me up there and so that's that's the disconnect that's the level of disconnect that that we're, we're looking at and in uh or going into understanding china for example there's been massive massive explosions going on in in numerous places in china that are absolutely unexplained nobody's talking about it well, hardly anybody and i'm going to be the first one to tell you i have no idea why it's happening you know, maybe there's some people that don't get along with Xi and he's going after them or they're going after this or some other oligarch is getting even with some other, you know, there's no way you're going to know. And it's like what uh, Cliff High was saying a few weeks ago. He said, you know, he's he's trying to figure out China. He says, I can't do it. You know? <clears throat> like I was explaining to a friend of mine, well, uh, the levels of culture in china are determined by language skill and so hey if you if you if you could speak the deeper levels of language or read the deeper levels you'll have access to certain information that if you if you don't have that ability forget about it you're, you're not going to be able to understand uh, what the manchu are up to because you can't read <laughs> their version of Chinese. And, and likewise for all the different groups. So all, it's all constellated according to, and, and when, you, when you get in the higher levels of Chinese, mind you, certain forms of their language, uh, there's 100,000 characters, okay? I mean, you, you couldn't even count that high, let alone memorize 100,000 characters. But I can assure you there are, that there are Jesuit priests that, that know them all by heart. And so what happened between China and the West? And, and you see with the story of Marco Polo going there and, and creating this bridge between the Vatican and China. And Rudolf Steiner makes a point, and I've mentioned this before. He said it wasn't that the, the, the Christians changed China, it was that the Chinese impulse came into Europe. And that's that group thing. That's what's going on right now. It's, it's like this hive mind. It's like, if you don't go along with what I think, then I'm mad at you. <laughs> okay, well, next. And so uh, it, it becomes that, but then when you automate it through artificial intelligence whatever that means and so you're you're willing to relegate your the limits of your freedom to subroutines well good luck with that see see how that works out for you but as for myself i think that that when, when you get into uh, the process of individuation you risk the challenge of egoism which rudolf steiner said will be the central problem as we move into the future is at these just abnormal development of ego forces that, that will cause division, divisive activity between uh, people. And that 
as we move into the into the sixth period and, and leading into the sixth root race, as it's called in theosophy, that that impulse is to where you are more concerned about the well-being of the person in front of you than you are about the well-being of yourself. You know, I, and like Jesus says, whatever you do unto the least of the children, you do unto me. And so we're way far away from any of that, to be perfectly honest. And, but we can have our aspirations, can't we? Right, now you brought the Chinese. <laughs> now you brought the Chinese up. Um, I normally can't stand Nicolas Cage, the most woke man in human history, um, apart from his depiction of Fu Manchu in Rob Zombie's uh, um, false movie advert called Werewolf Women of the SS, which uh, they've got to make that movie. I mean, I can't stand Tarantino, but the whole idea um, was what was it like going to a double bill of movies in the 70s or early 80s? And he's pulled it off. So you have the sort of the small movie, then you have a series of absolutely bewildering, you know, bewildering things for local restaurants and what movies are coming next. And then the main feature. I mean, for me, the whole show was stolen by Rob Zombie's fake adverts. And uh, that, that's just bizarre. I mean, so you get the, the Nazis realizing something's gone wrong so their last hope is Fu Manchu and you see Nicholas Cage screaming with mad laughter as Fu Manchu because he's the secret brain behind it all and so uh, I recommend that to, just the advert just the advert I recommend that to everybody because it's a bit of fun um and why are Nazis coming up uh, the best other version of that I ever saw was I don't know if any of you you Yankee boys have heard of Doctor Who, which seems to be a national obsession. I don't know why. When we were all kids, it was something you might watch or not watch. Um, it seems to become some sort of totem symbol for being British nowadays. But there was one remarkable uh, episode when uh, Doc Who uh, went to uh, have it out with the creator of the Daleks, not the character as it's been developed since, which is just nothing, but the original <laughs> couple of series where you get this horribly twisted guy in a wheelchair called Dabros, uh, surrounded clearly by the Nazi elite. And his one obsession is how to make the Daleks the super race. And uh, even though they, they all look a bit like, I mean, they turn, I think by that stage they're still human, but they end up turning into, into jellies or something. I don't know. And it, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So, and, 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 but did you catch the symbol? Or the 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 semiotic relationship between Davros and Davos. Oh, now it's interesting you say that because lots of people did think that was going on, um, and with the writers in that particular time frame, you're looking back, not now. There's no irony. There's no there's no imagination. There's no no cleverness in it now. Uh, some people did say that at the time. I mean, some people did say all these messages were being smuggled into Doc Who. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Um, uh, but, yeah, that was, I mean, my favourite character was Nidar, who is clearly Himmler, you know, who used to walk walk to the front of the front of the studio and stare at it and saying, you know, Davros is the greatest man who's ever lived. But you get the, the sort of whole, you know, slave hive mentality of all that. Because they can't think for themselves, they don't work for themselves, they don't do anything apart from serve this monstrous ideal. Um, why did all that come up? Um, because, yeah, I mean, subliminal messages, strange goings on. I noticed someone called Oswald Spengler suddenly appeared at the base of my screen. Everybody's got to remember, I never see the messages because my thousand-year-old laptop doesn't allow that. Um, I rather like Oswald Spengler. I think he's been appropriated by the uh, new right, the far right. Um, and not every one of them is a swine. I mean, some of them are actually quite decent people. Um, you know, they're not talking across the board or one or two, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, yeah, I rather like Oswald Spengler. He seems to me to have been appropriated intellectually as opposed to anything else. Uh, what we need to do is remember the visceral. I mean, we... The human, the visceral, the intuitive. I, I want more 
people being weird in public. I want more people doing group hugs like they used to. That's aging me. I want more people. You know, what was it that it went, what, what is so wrong in believing the world could become a better place? As an article of faith, you mentioned belief systems or, or BS, as Robert Anton Wilson used to call them. Um, I, I think we all need a bit more BS, to be honest. Um, we need a bit more respect for the R word. And we need to remember that all of our ancestors weren't entire fools and did know what they were talking about and actually could engage with us nowadays and maybe even do better. Um, I mean, a, a friend of mine was recently doing literacy tests uh, uh, <laughs> across modern London and realized Roman London, Londinium would actually beat literary tests when it came to modern London. Um, I do hope that doesn't, that particular theory, that piece of research doesn't see the light of day or that it's somehow in error. But there's a terrible thought. So, no, what we've got to do is embrace the positive and try and find ways forward because they're there. We need to remember it's all there. I mean, church people in particular, then I'll hand back, excuse me, are meant to be frightened of uh, psychology, psychotherapy. I can never see why. Um, psychology and psychotherapy are not doing what religious people are doing. If any minister is doing that, then he's, he's either working two jobs or he's misunderstood the calling of ministry. I mean, if I think of my, one of my own personal heroes, Bishop T.D. Jakes, um, his sermons are available on YouTube. That puts psychotherapy to shame, to my mind. Um, the man is on fire for a couple of hours and he's taking people through this momentous physical and inner journey to finally approach what might mean, what we might mean as Christians. Uh, an incredibly astute guy. You know, so there is hope. There's always light. There's always a better future. And we might, let's not be so critical and narrow in our judgments of the things around us because maybe they're providential and we just can't see it. Handing back, John. Caught me off guard. Yes. Well, Rudolf Steiner about Oswald Spengler, he said, well, the things that he says, if, if people don't uh, meet the challenge of the times, could very uh, well come true. <clears throat> and now more than ever, it's starting to look like the decline of the West. Excuse me, I had to clear my throat there. Well, uh, I wanted to share some, a little ditty that, that I think is relevant because Rudolf Steiner had said that the, he was comparing uh, uh, this one uh, German writer who uh, was saying certain things and that had been said by this other German writer. And he said, well, the, the inspiration that they drew upon was, was entirely different. And you just can't consider the words. You have to consider what is behind the words, and <clears throat> meaning that super sensible element. And here uh, he says, uh, what did the gods do to protect us from experiencing this world of forms before we are ready? They gave us pleasure. Pleasure in the joy of creating and working here in the physical world. What we find beautiful in a piece of art, for instance, by Raphael or Leonardo da Vinci, is not what is lasting in it. The piece of art itself, such as presented or intimated in the third mystery drama with the two paintings by Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Let's see, the piece of art itself is also not the element that is lasting. What is eternal is the spiritual process that went on in the artist's soul while creating the artwork, the spiritual process out of which the piece was created. And so that's in his Esoteric Lessons, Volume 3. But in any regard, that that's, that's the key. And, and elsewhere he says that artists and, and composers and creative people in general 
they don't realize, except very rarely, that there's something higher working through them when they create these things. And uh, that's very, very interesting because I was listening uh, to this woman who plays violin and piano, both uh, a level of virtuoso. And uh, she is, uh, well, she's a, uh, she's Bohemian, German, Czech, uh, however you want to describe it, but she's from the region of Bohemia, which is a really interesting region, by the way. And there, I saw this interview of her and she's getting into talking about what I just said about the whole idea of that there's this super sensible or spiritual presence that's connected to the music that 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 she works with and this woman like is spends more time in it probably than most anybody on the planet for the most part but out of joy and out of reverence the the, the kind of moods that she expresses you could see the genuineness of her as an artist that she's just not mechanically fulfilling a role in trying to be perfect but to be able to take a piece of music by a great composer and breathe life into it through inducing the feeling. And, and it takes a great deal of familiarity with classical music to be able to even recognize the difference of interpretation by various artists of these works, whether they be of Beethoven or Chopin or uh, anybody, uh, Rachmaninoff that there's a great deal of leeway as far as to the nuance that you bring to the performance. And what you're allowing there is allowing the intervention of the super sensible to enter into uh, your interpretation of, of the music through the realm of feeling. And I mean, that's, that's quite something just even to think about that. And uh, it was Rudolf Steiner uh, makes mention of it in, in great many places, but even Johann Wolfgang von Goethe made a reference to that. And uh, I, I read in one of the previous episodes, I don't remember which one, of course, there's far too many. We're in the 62nd episode here. But uh, he makes mention about the Duke that he worked for in, in, uh, in Weimar. And he, he talked about how that there was something higher working through him, but when when it was in, he you could ask him a question about anything, and he would give you an answer, and it was like always oh, right about all this stuff. But yet at other times, when that context, that soul context, wasn't there, he was just an exceedingly ordinary guy, you know. And so you have to realize that much of the content that you think that you're responsible for in your consciousness is not really you, by the way. It's it's that there's a super sensible element in your uh, consciousness and your thoughts and all of it. It thinks in you. And so that it's coming out of various levels. There's a lot of levels of nuance, but out of the sphere in speech of the archangels or, or other other beings can work, angels, archangels, archai even, that are influencing your thinking and even your action if you get to the realm of, of the archai and the way you do things. It's, I'm sure you've all done things that you wonder how you did it. You know, it's like uh, I got into a conversation a few weeks ago with uh, your friend, uh, the Reverend, and uh, he was discussing uh, how he just missed having a devastating car accident. And obviously his conscious mind wasn't formulating how to react to it. He just dealt with it. And so we all have this capacity in us, but it's it's our guardian angel that you can look to for a great deal of that. But that, you know, maybe only 20, 25% of your content is really you. I, I I mean I hate to I hate to point it out for you, but that there's all this going on. How many times have, have you had a song going through your head of of no you know in fact it could even be a song you don't even like, but it's going over and over in your in your head because you drove by a car 
uh, and stopped at a stoplight and the guy had it on the radio and you couldn't get it out of your head. You know, that's kind of gives you an inkling of, of that there are things that could be triggered in one's consciousness that one has, cannot bear full responsibility, especially emotional reactions when somebody says some forbidden word or uses a word in a way that, that's not approved, that you get all upset, you just get triggered. Well, there's really how much self-reference is in that? It's very little. It's it's like a knee jerk. It's like you're letting something. It's something that happens to you. It's not really something you're doing, and and one really has to look at that. If somebody can just say something to you and it gets you so upset, you really have to look at that. You have to look at yourself, not at them. They, whether or not they should be saying it or not, that's not the point. The real point is, how come you're so easily triggered, right? <laughs> That's what I look at. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier, is that there's this, the one tendency is to be indifferent to the world. That's, that's kind of like the non-attachment of the East, you know, the Luciferic thing. And then on the other hand, you have this grabbing hold of the world too hard, you know, and having that earthbound abstract thinking you know and and utilitarianism you know those guys it's like they got it all figured out and so you're gonna you're gonna conform to their theories of, of the world whether you like it or not because they got more money than you and so so there's all all manner of uh, isms and ologies or are, are uh, prisons of various decor but they're all prisons, nonetheless. Gosh, why are we, why are we prisons in China? Why are we <laughs> prisons in China on medical tourism? Um, oh, I suppose I've got to give my five pennies worth about China a bit more. Um, yeah, warlords, um, warlords and tongues. I mean, God knows what's happening over there. Do they know what's happening over there? You know, how communist is the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, there's a, does it really ever read anything on Marxism? Because you're doing it wrong, if that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> so, oh, there was, um, oh, I'd love to break China. Apparently they paid Meryl Streep a fortune when she was across there. So I'm jealous of that. Um, she, she performed years back with Yo-Yo Ma. I believe, before designated and invited party officials. Well, I mean, how much did they pay you, love? You know, and she was just going on and on and on about discovering herself. Oh, God, we all know, Meryl. We know. Give it a rest, please. But anyway, the Chinese hadn't heard it, so they gave it a thumbs up. Um, one of my favourite books is by that uh, demigod amongst writers, Italo Calvino, called Invisible Cities. Um, and the superstructure of the book is basically the arrival of Marco Polo in China. Um, and of course, he couldn't speak Mandarin. So what the explorer in the novel has to do is try and find a, a way to exemplify to the celestial emperor Kublai Khan his adventures. And the end of the book, after all these incredible cities have been described, you know, a paragraph here, a paragraph there, great wonders and nightmares, depending where he was traveling, or what the people were saying, or you know, where, where he was heading. And by the end of the book, he can speak Mandarin. And Kublai Khan is very quiet and sullen. And Marco Polo asks him in pure Mandarin, great emperor, why are you depressed? I mean, you used to enjoy our conversations. To which Kublai Khan replies, in the old days, I used to have to guess what you meant. You'd jump into the air, you'd growl, you'd sing, you'd throw your arms about, and all these images appeared in my mind. But now I know what you mean. Um, we throw away things like that at our peril, I suspect, um, in our desperation to be AI automatons. We're throwing away a bit too much, it strikes me, and we're mistaking a type of vocabulary for a possible cultural solution. That is actually very dangerous, and we've got to repel that at all possible costs. Um, yeah, I mean, where does it all go from here? I don't know. 
but I do know we've got to recover a sense of sanity and a sense of humanity and a sense of anthroposophy. Um, I love the art. I love the dancing. I love the books. Um, is it the only thing I love? No, uh, it fits very easily into congregationalism. That I didn't realise in the years years back. I didn't know. Um, but yeah, we need to in accentuate the positive, as I'm always saying on this show. Give Elon Musk a quarter five fingers on the schnoz. Keep it to yourself, Elon. We're not interested. Um, or maybe go and live on Mars with him. Who knows? Keep him company. We've got to. Uh, refind our route into what is important, what's valuable, what's meaningful. And that, for me, uh, as I say, are the early stepping stones of Christianity. Is the West failing? Uh, I think you have to have your eyes closed and your head buried like an ostrich in the sand at the moment, not to see that. Um, is that a good thing? No, it's not. Um, was the West, was Europe the source of all evil? Sadly, no, because then it would be easy to deal with. If there was one locus of evil and we all knew what it was, then it would be easy to deal with. That sadly is not the case. There are bad apples in every barrel um, and history is a bloodbath no matter where you look at it from. Um, apparently, Columbus Day causes a big ruckus over in the Americas at the moment. And it was an indigenous day they wanted to take over. I mean, do they remember the Aztec bloodbaths um, of how they used to con consecrate temples with the untold bodies and bloods of their slaves and their, their defeat, you know, the warriors they defeated in battle? Have they forgotten that? Or the fact the Aztec priests used to dance around in the removed epidermis of their enemies? I mean, you know. So are we seeing one baddie against a load of goodies? Sadly, no. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Biff Columbus, go back to where you came from, and we can all live in a sort of organic utopia, eating nothing but granola uh, to get our tummies working in the morning. Wouldn't it be great? Sadly, that's not the case. Um, and we've got to shake ourselves free of a type of egoism which is being fanned shamelessly by fantasy. Um, you know, my worry is that we forget history because without history, actually the Christian mysteries don't make the complete and compelling sense that they do to us as believers. I think I meant to keep talking because John is fiddling around with something. So and I, I feel guilty every time I drop him in it. And I don't mean to. It's just where I'm not sure what you're doing. Do I take it you're available to speak now? Is that a yes? Right, I'm handing back. I'm handing back. Uh, I'm reminded of the badger and the wind and the willows. Uh, that's an interesting character. I'll let you be the badger. My nickname at school was the badger. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, clairvoyant impressions are not always useful. <laughs> you know, I think it was uh, where I'm, I'm quite st strongly built, and I used to burrow in my endless need to question teachers about everything, and they clearly didn't know what they were talking about. So I think it was something to do with that. <laughs> well, that'll work for me. I, I wanted to share with you uh, something. I, I put a link uh, below on facebook and on youtube and uh there's this this wonderful website uh, uh the brunen von christus group website that uh, one of the contributors is uh, martha Keltz. and some of the questions that have come up here about rudolf steiner and whatnot are addressed uh, on their website so you can find the link below down with the resources i give near uh the Rudolf Steiner uh, website and all of that. And, but in addition to that, my friend, James Stewart, who is a person responsible for the, uh, the Rudolf Steiner archive, he is retired. He retired at the beginning of the month, so within the last month or so. And uh, he's turned over to some new people that are, are 
wonderfully qualified for this new metamorphosis. But they've opened a new website for Rudolf Steiner's work that probably most of you are unfamiliar, unless you got the notification from James or elsewhere. But it's the Steiner library.org and that's a Steiner online library. They're going to keep the uh, Rudolf Steiner archive going and they have this new one. Apparently there's certain issues of, of formatting and construction. The way the website's constructed and all that is that it, it, when you get into websites, you get into like when you keep adding things on and then you realize that, that the, the architecture of the website is an old form, then, you know, you need to, to replant, so to speak. And, and so that's what they, they've done, that they're going to have uh, a greater uh, capability uh, coming up through this uh, new website than they did with the old one because the architecture is more up to date. And uh, given my somewhat Luddite knowledge of those things, that's my description. And uh, if somebody knows better, they can uh, they can uh, correct me. But in, in that regard, so that's another wonderful thing that, that's happened. And by the way, James is not giving up. Uh, you know, he'll be in the background, but he's going to be focusing on bringing to translation into English uh, the great many lectures of Rudolf Steiner that have yet to be translated. I mean, you know, it's just a massive undertaking. It's when you consider that Rudolf Steiner did over 6,700 lectures and over 50 uh, published books and articles and so on and so forth, that he's, uh, to me, I, as far as I could tell, the most prolific a person of the 20th century, just like the way uh, you could say uh, Thomas Aquinas is, was quite prolific in his day and Aristotle before him. But in any regard, you might want to uh, uh, check out the, the, uh, that, web, that new website and the uh, Liza Shionatulander Shino and St. Thomas Aquinas the, with the uh, a Brunen von Christus group. And so that's that's my little shout out for all of that. And but I and I also don't want to forget because uh, I'm so often inclined to forget things. Uh, Reverend David William is is a very distinguished author. He's the author of The Grammar of Witchcraft. And that's a haunting conceit. But uh, that's not a how-to book. It's not a grimoire. It's it's a Shakespearean study, and uh, also he has his Shakespearean as poetry, Caliban's Redemption, and there's somebody on the cover with a funny hat. And then his major work is Mount Athos Inside Me: Essays on Religion, Swedenborg, and the Arts, edited by Daniela Irundus, a very talented young fellow. And this is uh, David's uh, seminal work, I guess we could call it. And these are all available on Amazon, and I heartily recommend them for your perusal. They're, and they're easy to find. And uh, I'm also an author myself, and I have two books. My first book, this is a very faded copy. I should probably pull a different one out so you can actually read it because it's fading out. The Arcana of the Grail Angel, the Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian Order, as a foreword by Douglas Gabriel, my best buddy, and has great many uh, diagrams are included in there. If I can get back there far enough. There we go. Well, you can't really see them that way. Uh, my second book of the, the 
diagrams are repeated in here in the arcana of light on the path. This is more of a meditative tool, but there's also a great many additional diagrams included in this book. And as forward by William Bento, the noted astrosopher and psychologist. And uh, here's the diagrams. So you can see that this can help in getting one to understand many of the subjects that we talk about, that if you have a cosmology, it gives you a, a greater means for, for being able to contextualize your understandings. And when you're working on riddles, that's a very helpful thing. And so that's what we're, that's what I'm doing here. And, but again, it gets back to uh, somewhat to what Meister Eckhart says, uh, if, if you're a king and you don't know it, what good does it do you? But uh, my books could be found on eBay, buy them from me. Uh, if you go to some of the other book websites, you might see them listed for totally extravagant amounts of money, but you can find them directly from me on eBay, or you can contact me directly through my academia website link that's uh, below, or uh, you could private message me on Facebook and we can work something out to where you could uh, get the books shipped uh, and I'm shipping them in a lot of different countries and all of that. The the uh, eBay account, of course, can only service people within the U.S. So, and there's that. And so, uh, we still got plenty of time left. I didn't get to any of the things, or very few of the things that I planned on talking about, but that's typical. And it also gives me something to look forward to because there are things I'd like to talk about, but I gradually, it's, it's like the sunset. As you, as you walk towards the sunset, it, it, it just keeps moving back. And so uh, that's kind of like traveling in the ocean. And that's a beautiful thing. And so in getting back to the thread that we're trying to, to pull on here, the, the, the thread of Ariadne, that, that can lead us through the maze, right? That's that's what it, that's what that means, you know. Ariadne is like the spider, and travels into the maze, but because of the thread that Ariadne has left behind, can follow the thread and get out of the maze. And so, we're all quite amazed, and and that's why we're in the predicament we're in because we've kind of lost touch, we've lost that thread. That, that that antikarana, that 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 thread that connects you to your higher vehicles, and so the the work of esoteric uh, development is the uh, reconstituting of the antikarana, which is that thread that connects your higher triad to the uh, lower quaternary, so to speak. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. And just in case somebody was wondering, <laughs> they're probably still wondering, but the, what is the Antikorana? It's the Rainbow Bridge, right? I mean, geez, Jimi Hendrix even wrote a song about it. And, uh, oh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that just because that'll be challenging. Got back into the C60 vibes, picking up, going to get some Monotonics, any thoughts on peptides, epithelon in particular? Uh, well, it would be too far afield right now, and I haven't given it much thought, but I'll give it some thought for, for in future. But notice I said in future. That's British. Were I American, I'd say in the future. And that's a whole other thing. I think that has something to do with peptides, too. But I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it's uh, ultimately, I think enzymes are the key. And, and, and if, if you look at the chemical composition of, of a stone could be uh, the, like as a fossilized, some fossilized animal, you analyze the chemical composition of that stone, and then you could analyze that, that animal, and you'd have the same thing basically because 
that fossilized stone is fossilized from that particular animal. But why is it so different? You know, the stone is a stone, an animal can walk around and and do all this, all the things that it does, and it's it's that enzymatic activity, and that 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 is the basis of of the life process within this animal world, so to speak. And 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 there's over eighty four thousand enzymatic activities that happen in in, in nano time, so that. When you look at, at things and you start getting into the microscopic, uh, it, it behooves one to be able to, at the same time, have a cosmology that can take you to the macroscopic level and, and be able to, to include the cosmos. And I think that that's what Georg Cantor was striving for, is that he always was mindful that he wanted to include the cosmos in to his, his approach to his equations and the whole idea of a transfinite numbers, you know, that's, that's, that's what he was striving for. But I think that the challenge that he had was he was trying to do uh, to a large extent with that, that uh, earth, earthly abstract intelligence that he probably should have would have done him great. Deal. In fact, he was contemporary with Rudolf Steiner and in the area. And I, I, I don't recall, but somebody said he went to one of his lectures even. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure. But he's a, he's a challenging figure. Georg Contour, you can look up on Wikipedia and find a lot of resources relative to him. Uh, I think at this point, uh, we should mention uh, projected geometry and just as a word you could look up see what that means but uh that's very helpful uh, the geometry can be very therapeutic for the mathematical side and if one gets tedious uh in delving into the mathematics then you can restore the the feeling of of life through studying geometry and and eating some raw food. Yeah, proteolytic enzymes are particularly powerful. Yes, they are. Raw food. Yeah, enzymes, very special. Over at American Intelligence Media, they're very big on enzymes. I'm big on them too. And I think that uh, one of the reasons so many people are, are plagued with such dead thoughts is they eat too much dead food, yeah, myself included. You know, it's like, can you can you devote your whole life to trying to to uh, eat? Well, that's what people used to do, and actually, ancient man was far more vital and healthy than we are. I mean, uh, it's there's no comparison. So that being said, I don't I don't want to belabor the point, but yeah, vegan be, vegan can be very therapeutic, but you want to get your D three. Jeez, uh, I I been doing like the last few days just because of the change of season we finally got some snow today i i've been doing about twenty five thousand. i used uh, a day right that's that's a some of you think that's quite a lot but you know cliff he does a hundred thousand but he's 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 a rare bird indeed and and so that being said i i think that at this point we're getting near our conclusion here in, in this wonderful conversation that just seems to have no uh, culmination. But I, I, uh, it would be nice if we could get David to share with us perhaps even the Pater Nostra, the Lord's Prayer, because that has a special place in both of our lives. Um, I re just a few things. I remember um, the, the anthropologist Richard Rudgeley is a good friend of mine. His first book, The Alchemy of Culture, I remember him agonizing in front of me over, over coffee, whether entheogens actually existed or not. And he, I remember him saying, if they exist, I can get this book done in the next couple of weeks. So I had a vision and I decided they did exist. So and the book was done in the next couple of weeks. Um, no, we need... We need to 
remember the things of the past uh, with respect. Not all of them, but some of them. They, you know, we, our ancestors weren't uniformly wrong about everything. And there's a great deal of knowledge and wisdom and life and health giving habits that we've lost. Um, I just like to say before I get to the Lord's Prayer, uh, something I mentioned on uh, uh, the uh, when I was giving a, a sermon uh, slightly earlier. Um, I was talking a little about the prophetic materials. I'm looking now. It was Mark 13, uh, 24 to 32, uh, the coming of the Son of Man. And I was saying, you know, Christ is looking for us, not the other way round. And therefore, they're, they're, there's a strange meeting point. New Christians are searching. They want names. They want facts. They want dates. They want wow. You know, guns shooting. And that's great. That's great. But there comes a time when you've also got to meditate. and You've got to think more deeply. I suspect it's at that point. Um, and I'm not saying the Son of Man won't come in history, in a historical setting later on. I'm a pastor. Of course I do. But is he reviving in our hearts and our minds? Are we meeting him there before that joyous day? Is, is Jesus Christ being reborn into our lives? Because that's when we meet him when he's searching for us and not the other way around. Uh, it, it's good to remember that on a, on a Remembrance Sunday. Um, Let's finish with the Lord's Prayer. I mean, if you wouldn't mind, my friends, colleagues, dear John, just bowing your hearts for a few moments as we remember all of the blood and all of the pain and all of the sweat and all of the tears that led our good Lord to pronounce the following. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Gee, I think you, you reading it is, is one of my favorite versions. You, you, I, but then I'm not surprised as you're British and, and they are thespians, you know, your, the theater is your home. Well, I want to bid adieu to all of our friends that have showed up and, and, and also in future to all of those that haven't shown up as yet. And this has been another wonderful episode. It's, it's quite fascinating to me because David and I have hardly ever spoken off of this show. So you know as much about each other or as we know about each other, you, you, uh, you're on the inside track on this conversation because uh, we don't we don't chat it up off camera. Anyways, thank you so much, David, and everybody else. Uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs>